kidding me? You are looking live. Winning cures everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in, Winning Cures Everything, doing a bit of a different show today. I am riding solo. Uh, this is the April 1st slash April 2nd show, recording April 1st. Podcast will be out on Friday, April 2nd. Uh, but we have some things to discuss. Obviously, we wanted to get out the Final Four picks, and we had some news happen in college basketball. That's all we're going to talk about today, college basketball. We could have talked about Kyle Pitts. We could have talked about all sorts of different things going on with the NFL and whatnot, but because of a shorter show and because we just wanted to make sure that we got the show out there for you all, uh, we're just going to talk college basketball. So before we do that, winningcureseverything.com is the website. You can go check that out. I was on earlier today with Jonathan Hood from ESPN 1000 in Chicago. You can go listen to his podcast as well to hear my thoughts on uh, some NBA stuff and college basketball, the Final Four, what's going on there. Uh, So go ahead and and check out his podcast. But winningcureseverything.com, once his podcast is up, Uh, I will have it posted on our website as well. So go ahead and check out the site. And our college football show is up over at SBR Picks. You can search it out on YouTube, SBR Picks, very easy sportsbook review. Or just go to the website, sbrpicks.com slash NCAAF. Or we've got the video posted on winningcureseverything.com as well. So go ahead and check that out. We would certainly appreciate it. Uh, Topic number one for today North Carolina head coach Roy Williams has decided he is going to retire. He's out. He said, finito, I'm done. He leaves with a 903 and 264 record. That is 77.4% winning percentage. Look, he spent 10 years as an assistant at North Carolina under Dean Smith. He spent 15 years as a head coach at Kansas. And then just spent the last, what, 18, 19 years, 18 years as the head coach at North Carolina. It makes perfect sense. Over the past however many years, I'm not surprised, and and none of you should be either. Uh, The only surprise, I guess, is that he announced it on April 1st, and it wasn't a joke. But he is getting up there in age. He's in his 70s at this point. He's been hurting for years. He's finally getting back to where he can move around more, right? But he's been telling Gary Parrish and uh, Jeff Goodman and uh, all these Uh, really respected, uh, well-connected college basketball writers for years. After he had surgery, after he had all those things go wrong medically, that his health has not been good. He even told Gary Parrish at one point, if you listen to the Ion College Basketball podcast, that he could not even stand up at practice anymore a few years ago. Now, he has gotten back to where he's been doing better, Luckily, he's he's up moving around. He's in better shape than he has been in years and years. Uh, his health is significantly improving. But with the way that college basketball is changing, if you have been coaching this game for 40-some-odd years, why would you want to stick around and, and deal with a complete systematic change of the sport that you know so well? I don't blame him for getting out of here. Other people will have to adapt. He doesn't. I mean, he's old enough at this point, he's made enough money, he can ride off into the sunset and enjoy the last 20, 30, who knows, 40 years of his life. Why go through the hassle of it with all the transfers and the new NIL stuff and the way that the sport is changing? College athletics is completely different at this point than it was even five years ago. So I don't blame anybody for wanting to get out at this point. So... Roy Williams, cheers to that. The question for North Carolina is, who's next? So, and I've had people text me already today and and say they got to go out and go after Jay Wright and they got to go after Nate Oates and they got to go. That's not how North Carolina has done things, right? It's always been in the family with them. Now, should they go after the best possible coach? Absolutely. I do not disagree with that. Do I think they will? Probably not. Wes Miller played at North Carolina. He is the head coach at UNC Greensboro. They have done really, really well. He won a SOCON tournament uh, tournament this year. SOCON conference tournament this year. Let me say it correctly. But he's a really, really good coach. That would not be a bad option. The other option, former ESPN 
uh, college basketball analyst. I was going to say talking head, but it's same thing. Hubert Davis has been on the staff with Roy since 2012. I think he probably has a pretty good shot at it. And for those that ask, well, if you are just going to move it down the line and give it to Hubert, why would you not just go ahead and announce that? Well, part of that is now that Roy is actually retiring himself, why not give Roy that day? And then you can give Hubert his day because he has not been a head coach. So you do Roy today. Everybody celebrates him over the Final Four whatever. Next week, you announce Hubert Davis, and then he has his day, and everybody gets to celebrate him as opposed to celebrating Roy. I think it's really smart and a good way to do it if that is, in fact, the direction that they go. Who knows what they end up doing? I mean, do do you try and call Tony Bennett? Do you try and call uh, Chris Beard, who just took the Texas job, who we'll talk about here in a minute? Uh, There's a lot of different really good candidates that would be great for this job, and this is... In my estimation, the best college basketball job out there. So there, any candidate that they wanted to talk to will actually sit down and have a conversation with them. John Calipari might sit down and have a conversation. I don't think that's the way that they want to go, and I don't think that's where Calipari wants to go, but you never know. So I think anybody that they call would listen, but for them it's got to be the right fit, and I don't know that I blame them for sticking in-house. It's worked for years. It didn't work with Bill Guthrie. It didn't work for Matt Doherty. But it certainly worked with Dean Smith, and it certainly worked with uh, Roy Williams. I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens. We will see what happens. Uh, moving off of Roy Williams, let's talk about uh, Chris Beard. Texas hires the Texas Tech head coach, and Chris and I talked about this on the show before. The fact that Texas would go and hire, you know, little brother's head coach. And they didn't want to do it in football. That's why they didn't go after Matt Campbell, which we don't necessarily know that they didn't go after Matt Campbell. But either way, that Texas, their ego would get in the way and they wouldn't allow them uh, themselves to go and hire a coach from another school in the Big 12 because they felt like they were better than everybody, you know, whatever. Truth of the matter is this. Chris Beard is a Texas alum. That's one way to explain it away, Right. The other side is, since he started as a Division I head coach in 2015, he is 142 and 60. That is over 70% winning percentage. Uh, I mean, he's he's never lost in the first round of an NCAA tournament, so that is definitely a step in the right direction. This man took Texas Tech to a national title game appearance and an Elite Eight appearance the year before that. I mean, that's insane. That is absolutely nuts to think about. But the guy can coach. Everywhere he goes, the team gets better from where they start the season until the end of the season. They're just a better basketball team every time he gets done putting together a roster. I think this is a great hire for Texas. I mean, he's already shown he went and hired UT Arlington's head coach as an assistant on his staff. Money is not going to be an object. Like, there will be no issues with that, with this Texas staff. This bunch wants to win, and they want to win right now, and I think it's perfect for Chris Beard. It, it, I think that this job was his ultimate end goal. It's where he went to school. It's what he's known. You know, Texas Tech was perfect for a while, and it's not like he wasn't getting paid at Texas Tech. But the resources that Texas can give you to win a national championship, which is what he's shooting for, vastly overwhelm what Texas Tech can do. It's, it's just... A proven point. It's easier to recruit to Austin. It's easier to get players there than it is to Lubbock. Uh, The amount of money that you can get in to build resources and whatnot, uh, build facilities, everything else, Texas is already there. You're good to go. So I don't blame Chris Beard for taking this job whatsoever. Uh, The question would be, what does Texas Tech do next? I mean, who knows? Uh, I mean, it's, it's definitely a good job. You're going to be well compensated. And the resources are good. They're just not as good as Texas. So what does their candidate pool look like? And as of right this second, I have no idea. We will probably get to that next week, but I could not begin to to even come up with a list. I would imagine probably Abilene Christian's coach. I believe it's Joe Golding. Um, That might work. I mean, Beard was an alum from Abilene Christian as well. 
he might have told them, and, and obviously they made it to the round of 32 this year. He's a pretty good head coach. That might work. North Texas's head coach, that could work. Uh, but North Texas's head coach is in the running for the Oklahoma job as well, along with Porter Moser. So who knows? Who knows what to expect from any of this? But I think it was a fantastic hire, uh, albeit an expected one, but definitely a good hire. And I would expect big things from Texas, even starting with next year. I think he can stabilize that roster, and I think Texas is always going to have enough talent to be a threat in the Big 12 and in the NCAA tournament. So, we will move on from that, and let's go ahead and discuss the Final Four. Okay, Final Four, we'll uh, we'll talk about the first game first. Baylor is a five-point favorite over Houston. Uh, Flip over my notes here. Look, the big thing that, that Baylor does really, really well they're number one in the country in three-point percentage. That is insane. Absolutely insane. But all their dudes can shoot it. Mitchell, Teague, um, uh, good gracious. Who am I missing? Um, <laughs> I'm completely blanked. I cannot remember. Uh, Butler, Jared Butler. Good gracious. What am I thinking? Uh, those guys are all ridiculous guards, right? The biggest thing in this game is the difference between what the teams look like, and what these stats tell you, right? Analytically, Ken Palm has Baylor as only a one-point favorite in this game. I think the biggest problem is Houston has not seen anything close to what they are going to see with Baylor. Uh, The biggest X factor in the game, I believe, is going to be Matthew Mayer. Uh, He's going to have a big-time matchup advantage. I I think he has the ability to take over at certain points in this ballgame. I'm going to take Baylor to cover. I think this this round, the Final Four, gets a little chalky, right? I understand that Houston is a two seed, but if you look at who they've played to get here, it's been what Cleveland State, um, da, 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 da. Cleveland State, Rutgers, Syracuse, and Oregon State, all double digit seeds, all have flaws. Baylor is not nearly as flawed as those teams. I just think that Baylor is going to be able to overwhelm them. So give me Baylor minus five in this spot, and and we'll see what happens. We will see what happens. Uh, Moving on from there, let's talk about Gonzaga and UCLA. UCLA, fantastic story. It's been great. And and everything about it, I mean, they've beaten really good teams. Alabama, Michigan, both ranked in the top five at the end of the season. However, the way that they got there, Michigan and Alabama combined shot 10 out of 39. 10 out of 39 from three-point range in their two games. On top of that, they shot 17 out of 36 from the free-throw line. That's a, I don't think free-throw defense is a thing. I don't expect Gonzaga to be missing free-throws. I also don't think that UCLA will be able to match up with them. They were able to match up with Michigan. They were able to match up with Alabama, but all of the teams that UCLA beat to get to this point were all flawed in some way. There was something that UCLA could take advantage of. With Gonzaga, there's nothing. This is the best team that I've seen in 30 years. They are unreal. Like The way that they play, they make everything look effortless. I've talked about it for weeks now. Everything is so seamless. There are no issues with this basketball team at all. I I just don't see where UCLA will be able to find any kind of an edge in this game. And the only thing they could do to cover the 14, not even to win. I don't think they can do anything to win. To cover the 14, you do what you've done and and you slow it down. I mean, you're, you're talking walk it up the floor, take 20 seconds before you take your first shot, that kind of stuff. Drag, drag, drag the game down. I don't know that Gonzaga will allow them to do that. Gonzaga's tempo is even faster than Alabama's. And, you know, with overtime, they ended up beating Alabama 88-78. to In this spot, I fully expect Gonzaga to to cover the 14, and, and I think their team total over 80 also hits as well. Those are my three bets on the Final Four for Saturday, and then we'll be back in plenty of time for Sunday's, or sorry, for uh, uh, Monday's national championship game which I think will be Gonzaga and Baylor, which is what we've been talking about since the beginning of this season. These have been the two best teams all year. It is absolutely fitting that they will be 
the two teams in the national championship game. A um, few more notes on it. Uh, UCLA, uh, I just, uh, looking at, you know, Jaime Jaquez, uh, Tiger Campbell, Johnny Juzang, like these are all players they would all have to absolutely just go off the same way kind of Austin Rivers did. And Oklahoma still, with Austin Rivers absolutely going off, still could not stay within, you know, 15 and a half of them. They, they got beat by 16. I, I think this one's worse. I think UCLA is not as good as Oklahoma was even on that day. I think Drew Timmy, I think that uh, Kispert, I think Jalen Suggs, that, that team is just so much better rounded than UCLA. This has been an incredible story. I love uh, the Hep Cronin story. I love all of this. I love the fact that their best players are on the bench with injuries, and, and it's this ragtag bunch that's coming out and playing like this. But I, I think this is where the buck stops. So that is going to be the show for today. It's only 60 minutes long, not not too, too much. But we certainly appreciate you guys for coming in and hopping in with us. Leave your picks in the comments if you're watching on YouTube. We would love to hear from you. Let us know your opinion on, on all of these do you think Baylor covers? Do you think uh, Gonzaga covers? You know, what we want to know your thoughts. Also, your thoughts on who the next North Carolina coach is going to be and who the next Texas Tech coach is going to be. We uh, we want to hear from you. So head over to winningcureseverything.com. Go to sbrpicks.com slash NCAAF. And hopefully, hopefully, all of your tickets cash this weekend. Thanks for listening to the Winning Cures Everything podcast. The website is winningcureseverything.com, and if you want to connect with us, we're on Twitter, at GaryWCE, at ChrisBGiannini, at Winning Cures, or you can email us, Gary at winningcureseverything.com, or Chris at winningcureseverything.com. Subscribe everywhere you need to subscribe, and we'll see you soon.